Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. You are listening to your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy, and I'm here with Kevin Curley, and it is tax day. Happy tax day, Kevin. Oh, that's not what I'm celebrating today. Tom, I'm celebrating something completely different, and I think you know what it is. I think I've earned myself a green jacket, and you know why. Back-to-back years in our bold prediction segment, last year, Scotty Scheffler told everybody this was going to happen. It happened. This year, John Rahm, never a doubt. We all knew Brooks was going to choke. <laughs> <laughs> I think the slow play Patrick Cantlay Wait, actually back won to back? John Rom. Yeah, back to back. So I can't promise anything in 2024, wow. but you know, give credit where it's due, right? Well, let's see if you can go for the trifecta and the S and P 5000 by year end. Then I'll be then I'll really be impressed. <laughs> I'd be curious to know if you put odds on you know those two guys winning the Masters and or the S&P 500. Somehow you were able to parlay those in Vegas. What kind of odds you could get on all those things happening? It's got to be some monster odds. <laughs> yeah, well, they're looking better and better. They're going down, that's for sure. Um, yeah. Well, let's jump into it. Uh, mid-month pod. Let's start with our, our usual central bank roundup. We'll go to our odd makers, and then we'll finish with something or nothing. Shine those boots. It's time for... <laughs> Okay. Central Bank Roundup. So let's start with the Central Bank. Uh, Fed meeting coming up in May next month after some pretty decent and uh, hopeful inflation numbers that we saw. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts with the Fed? I just listened to what all the Fed governors are saying. And Christopher Waller recently said, yeah, inflation's down, but 5% isn't 2%, and we're going to keep going. Um, if you listen to what each of them has said, and Jerome Powell obviously has the biggest microphone, they've all said we're going to raise rates again in May. So I would expect at least a quarter point uh, at the next meeting. Yeah, well, the market would, would say you're wrong. The market. What does the market say? The market's got it priced in completely different. You look at the market expectations by year end, there's a 30% chance that we're at four and a quarter in the Fed funds rate. This was as of April 17th. 10% chance that it's at 4%. The bulk of it seems to be at four and a half, around a 35% chance that we're at Fed funds rate of four and a half. Whereas the FMOC, they have a 56% chance that it's at 5%. Um, and ch- by their track record, Powell saying in December 2021 that he expects the Fed funds rate to be at 85 basis points by the end of 22. I'm going to go with the market on this one and say that we're going to be lower uh, from where we're at now. Now, are they going to go in May? I think I think he will. I think he'll go to another quarter basis point. I think that'll be the end of it, and uh, hopefully, hopefully they start cutting uh, as we get through the summer. Do you give any credibility to the fact that their meeting minutes said that they're expecting a mild recession before the end of the year? What, what are we supposed to make of they're causing a recession? We're going to raise rates anyway. Well, that's just the thing. If if they are, it, you know, by the way, everyone wants to cheer for lower rates and them starting to cut again. If they do start to cut and, the, and, they, and they get a full percentage point lower, that means something really broke. And it means that we probably are in a pretty ugly recession. So it's not all – you know, be careful what you wish for type of thing. But if they do cut that quickly, it's because they went too far, which, you know, I think they personally have. And I think a lot of others feel the same way. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's a good chance there is a, a pretty big recession and they're going to have they're going to have no choice but to cut at that point. And they're not alone. Friends across the pond, the Bank of England, as well as the European Central Bank, have both said they're going to continue to raise rates next month. They're anticipated to be even more hawkish. We've seen this play out recently in the fact the euro is strengthened against the dollar, got some recent dollar weakness. Why Why are they still raising rates? Why are they so much more aggressive in the U.S.? And does it make a difference on the currency? I think it does make a difference in the currency. I think that's probably one of the biggest catalysts is that they have to catch up. They can't 
get their currency devalued, um, you know, they got to protect it. And by raising rates, it does just that. And look how quickly the U.S. What you know, got out of the gates before anyone else. So I think they're all just catching up, right or wrong. I, I don't know, but I think that's one of the one of the reasons. And they also see that inflation is is sticky. It's not just here; it's it's everywhere. Yeah, I think the currency is the easy way to see is central bank policy working, and the fact that the ECB is a little more aggressive, the BOE is a little aggressive. You're seeing that reflected in currencies. Um, if we go over to Asia, same thing. New Zealand, Australia, Bank of Japan, everybody's saying inflation's a problem. Uh, in the case of Japan, finally a problem for the first time in a generation. Uh, they're kind of excited about it, so they're in a different shape than everybody else. But uh, I think the trend still is higher rates, uh, maybe a pause for the Fed after May, and maybe six months behind for the ECB and the BOE and all the other major central banks. Well, you know, the big the big jump in you know, prior to this whole banking crisis, call it a month ago, uh, the market was kind of in line with the Fed expectations. We all hire for longer, and they're going to continue to go probably past five for their terminal rate. And then when we had this whole banking crisis, that's when that's when the market started pricing in much lower rates. So again, but more forward looking. I don't know if the market knows something that we don't, but that was. That was the big, big drop in expectations, and it'll be curious to see if that was just a small blip and if the Fed just continues to, to push along. All right, let's go uh, play our first game of the day, a little bit of odds makers. All right, Tom, Kevin McCarthy was on TV a lot this week. He was visiting Wall Street. He gave a speech on fighting the debt ceiling, uh, said there will not be a raise of the debt ceiling without cuts in spending. But he also said they're not going to default. So I ask you first, and then I'll answer. What are the odds of a U.S. default in June? Zero. Absolute zero. There's no way <laughs> the U.S. is going to default. By the way, I don't care what side of the fence you're on, left or right. It's That's the challenge in Washington right now. It's political suicide to have any type of austerity package. So I don't think that's coming. And no one is going to just let the U.S. default. So they're going to keep pushing the can, kicking the can down on the road. The debt's going to keep mounting. And by the way, with interest rates as high as they are, just the just the interest carry alone on the debt is going to is going to snowball it, and we're just going to keep writing IOUs. So I think, all joking aside, I think it's less than five percent that the U.S. goes in, into into default. Yeah, I, I I'm going to go one percent. Uh, and the reason why is that I think the true re real answer is zero because there's no reason for them to default. And the Treasury can get real creative and maybe last till September and buy themselves three months for the Congress to continue to negotiate. But the danger is there. Uh, I've seen it compared to a game of chicken, and I think that's probably appropriate is who's going to blink. Our Kevin McCarthy and his very tenuous speakership could it break if he doesn't get the cuts he demands or, you know, Biden, could he be blamed for causing the default of the U.S. debt for, you know, that's that'd be a major <laughs> black swan event, I guess we'll call it to be nice. But it would be a disaster from the U.S. when it comes to passing budgets to our debt to everything. It's also political suicide. So, you know, risking America, you know, the full faith and credit is a dangerous game to be playing. I don't think that anybody wins through a default. So I'm going to go one percent because. I've seen a lot of crazy things happen. I mean, who thought three years ago we we're all going to lock in our houses for a few months, right? I would have said zero percent leading into that no, week. It's, it's, it's like it's like Groundhog's Day. I remember back in it must have been two thousand eleven or twelve when they had the the countdown clock on CNBC and Fox and all the news media outlets of the fiscal cliff and the countdown and nothing happened. It's like Y two K all over again. You know, everyone thought people were going to break out of the jails and the zoos were going to open and <laughs> it was going to be all chaos. I'm still waiting for yeah. it. <laughs> so. Well, let's let's move on. <laughs> Apple Apple rolled out uh, Bacon 2.0 with their Apple Card. Now a savings account yields 4.15. What do you think the odds are that Apple buys Goldman Sachs to become a bank? I'm going to give this a 25 percent chance of happening. They had first entered, we'll call it the uh, retail consumer banking market, with their Apple Card. Um, 
maybe two years ago. Then they did their buy now, pay later. And now they're kind of on to this. We're going to provide us no fee savings account that yields over 4%. You know, if you're a Marcus customer for Goldman, you can't get that 4% rate. So it seems like Apple negotiates sweeter deals for their customers. Uh, I don't know that they would want to buy all of Goldman Sachs. Maybe they'd buy part of it and maybe kick the investment bankers to the curve and go back to be a partnership over there. But I'm going to say 25% chance that the future holds Apple or Goldman Sachs, a subsidiary of Apple, uh, on some business cards. Well, let's, let's just be clear. Apple's not giving sweeter deals to their customers. You just don't have enough money with Goldman to to, <laughs> to get those kind of deals. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, with Goldman Sachs, they don't care about anyone else about except for their top top notch uh, investors. Which you know, it is what it is. I I don't th- I don't think the odds are very high. I, I would I don't think Goldman would be able to to sell. Um, I just I don't see how that would I don't see how that would work. I don't know if Apple could even afford them. I think they have enough cash to buy them out based on market cap today, and I think they'd still have some cash left over. So I'm going to stick with 25. percent um, So this past week kicked off earnings seasons, or sorry, the first quarter earnings season. We had J.P. Morgan and other banks start to report income. Them specifically, record net interest income. Part of that report showed that they pay savers 0.01% on their deposits, which is a pretty sweet deal if you can borrow for free and lend out for 5 or 6%. So what are the odds a year from now, banks like J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, etc., are paying rates near what Treasury bills, money markets are paying, you know, four or five, some, you know, some, something reasonable as opposed to basically zero. I think, I think it'd be zero because if they were going to pay anything, now is the time. I mean, rates, money markets have been up north of 4% for uh, quite some time. I mean, you're, they haven't moved at all. If you're with one of the big three, Wells, Chase, B of A, you're, you're getting that 0.01% unless you're in their private client group and getting, special treatment uh, for the average investor that banks through one of these three, that's what you're going to continue to get because they don't need it. They don't, they have one, just the fact that they're one of the big three. Look how many people left the regional banks and the credit unions to go to JP, to Bank of America, to Wells because of the whole banking crisis. Um, and just the safety net that they provide, they don't need to to compete with the SoFis and the and the Marcuses and the Capital Ones of the world that are getting close to four um, percent, but I don't think that's right. You know, and if I, I we have this cl- conversation with clients all the time, if if you're with one of these bigger banks and you're looking for some sort of high yield interest or, or money market fund within your bank, you're going to have to go to the regional banks or even just the online banks. The online banks are paying the highest yield from what I found because they don't have the overhead with the brick and mortar. Um, so I think the odds are very low that if they haven't moved up their, their savings rates now, why would they? Yeah, I'm with you. I think the odds are basically zero on this one. And I think I'd go a step further and say, you know, they don't even have to make risky loans to make money on these deals. So if you and I were to park some deposits over at JP Morgan and they're going to give me 0.01 and let's say that's excess reserves for them, they can go park that at the Fed and make 5% on overnight just for excess reserves being planted there, right? That's a free 5% that they're making just off of my money being parked there. They don't have to do a mortgage. There's no underwriting. There's no expenses. This is free money to them. And you see it in their net interest income for sure. All banks care about are deposits. That's the name of the game. The more in deposits they have, the more leverage they can go out and lend, whether it's lending or to your point, just leveraging up to go get four and a half percent risk free. It's all about deposits. And you talk to any of these regionals or any of these smaller banks, and the challenge right now outside of outrageously high interest rates is capital starting to dry up because of deposits and not many banks are lending now. And it's it's getting very interesting and you have to go to one of these bigger banks to get to get financing um, in general. Yeah, look the same thing's happening in the credit markets, right? So higher grade corporate debt seeing tons of inflows, yet the riskier stuff, so triple C or worse, you know, their yields are jumping. They can't get funded, and I don't think it's anything different. And this is you want a flight to quality. Uh, So this is a flight to quality in the sense that your money's going to be there. There's no risk. If you think of your regional bank and you just saw Silicon Valley and two others go under, you don't really want to park your money there, especially if you're above the FDIC limit, knowing that, hey, they might not bail out the, you know, consumers next time. They might just let that one go as a reminder 
this can happen to you. Yeah, I I agree with you. And it's amazing the market share that they just took over in the last month, these these big banks. And like you said, they're all reporting now and they look really, really, really strong. I don't think that's going to that's going to change. Um, OK, Oracle has spent one hundred and fifty billion buying shares since 2011. Uh Coincidentally, Larry Ellison has not sold any shares during that time and now controls 43% of the company. What are the odds he gains a majority through just company buybacks? Um, you know, I think he's on pace that by 2026 he will have majority share. I think the odds are 100%. Uh, Ten years ago, he owned like 20% of all the outstanding shares. Now, without buying a single one and not selling one either, he's at 43%. I know they had to take a little bit of a break on their buyback program, reduce it slightly um, for some one-time costs from an acquisition. But this is going to happen. And I think at 2026 or sooner, he's going to get to be the majority shareholder. And, you know, this is a testament to the old Buffett thing about you kind of just sit there and wait and you just buy back shares and you become more valuable. So I also would give credit to them. I mean, $150 billion on buybacks. And it's not being used to just sterilize stock banks comp is really incredible. And the contrast here between them and Salesforce is tremendous. Salesforce has this terrible reputation among investors of issuing stock, stock based comp, and then buying back that stock based comp, which is really just some financial engineering. It's not really the purpose of buybacks, it doesn't create value. I give Oracle a lot of credit for doing a stock purchase plan correctly. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll touch on this because it gets a bad rap as financial engineering, which it, it can be. Um, but you know, basically, how stock buybacks work and why people think that it, you know, kind of propels the individual stock price itself is because you have earnings on the top as the uh, numerator, and you have shares, outstanding shares, as the denominator. And the only way to get that number up is to one increase earnings which you can't just do it at thin air, or decrease the denominator, which is shares outstanding. And that's what a companies will do a lot of time to get their earnings per share up to look better. And that's why a lot are against the stock buybacks. They think it's financial engineering. But I agree with you to your point that you have guys like Warren Buffett who, you know, by the way, I think he is majority ownership now in Occidental. He's been buying shares for the last 18 months um, in that company. It's They've made a lot of money doing it over the years, and I, I agree with you on the odds of Larry Ellison owning it by, by 2026. He's getting there. All right, let's move on to uh, another fun way to review the headlines and a little something we call something or nothing. All right, let's start with the Italian birth rate. Only 393,000 Italian babies were born in 2022. That's the lowest number since 1861 is less italian baby something or nothing i think this is definitely something um, the italians have had to try and bribe people to have babies if you have a newborn child they'll give you anywhere from 50 to 175 euros per month for each child that you have this has been a trend going on for 15 plus years um, it's a major demographic crisis it's estimated their population is going to go from 59 million to 48 million over the next 30 years, which is a tremendous drop. The implications of this are huge. I mean, from just a basic of not enough doctors to all the pressure on the healthcare system and older population, um, the only thing good for the Italians is they're not alone. So Spain, North, or South Korea, or even worse, but almost every advanced economy, all but one, which the one is Israel, has seen declining birth rates uh, below two. And so if that's the case, you got shrinking populations across all advanced economies. This is something. This is a big something. What, what in comparison, do you know what the birth rate was in the U.S. last year? Um, I think it's 1.8. I'd have to get the exact numbers. But they compared it in the article that I saw that uh, Spain and Korea, and this is only South Korea, have 0.8 children for every woman which is wild. So Italy's at 1.24 children for every, uh, every woman in the country. So the, the numbers I think that I understand them to be is once you fall below 2.1, your population starts to shrink. So you need replacement level of mom and dad plus somebody in order for them to uh, just maintain the size of their population, which is uh, tremendous. And it's, it's going to be a demographic crisis, at least in the advanced world. 
um, over the next 30 years. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's really interesting. I did not hear about this. It'll be uh, well, maybe it'll be good for the Jersey Shore going forward. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'd love to dig in on that comment and know more, but yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll say that. <laughs> we'll, we'll pass. I opened, I opened myself up to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the part that we should make into a video. Uh, Tom explains Jersey Shore demographics. <laughs> All right, Tom. Um, I got another one in life expectancy. So every country in the world took a hit during the pandemic on how long they expected each person in their population to survive. Uh, so, you know, usually somewhere in the 80s is where we've seen it. It's been increasing for the last 50 years or so. There's one big problem in that one. The U.S. life expectancy is not bouncing back. Uh, for example... A person who makes $100,000 of income in the United States, so household income, is expected to only live to 80. If you compare that to somebody in England, now they use pounds over there, a little different currency, so we're going to say 65,000 pounds. The average person lives to 85, so five extra years simply by being English. And you wonder, all right, maybe it's money. The top 1% in each country is about the same as far as life expectancy. I would maybe mention the fact that Americans' top 1% is exponentially higher levels of wealth in absolute terms. Uh, but the other side is kind of worse. The poor people in England uh, are living as long as the average American. So you can be in a town called Blackpool, which is considered kind of the, one of the most deprived towns in England, and you live as long as the average American. So life expectancy getting worse in the U.S., Tom, do you think this is something or is this nothing? No, it's, it's definitely something. Um, you know, you want to fix Social Security. Here's the way. Just keep keep having the uh, average life expectancy go, go more and more down. I mean, this country, the, the health, you, know, you go to anywhere else in the world, it's just amazing when you see how fit they are and just the lifestyle. And, I mean, you, you – you, drive to the middle through our country you can't go three miles without seeing a fast food restaurant it's just i don't think it's getting any better um i think there's i mean i think there's a million things that are probably causing it but you know you look at the countries that have the highest life expectancy you know it's places like italy uh monaco i saw up there parts of asia they just have better diets they have i think lower stress levels um, you know, I don't know if it, I don't know how much it has to do with the, the food and the preservatives. And you've seen all the documentaries. I mean, there's thousands of them on, on Netflix. I don't even know which one to believe anymore. But I, I, th I think it is something, and um, it, it'll be interesting to see how this this whole thing pans out. Yeah, I, I would agree. It's something. I, you know, it's a tough one because I think you have some lifestyle choices. They're definitely a driving cause. But in the United States, we have this major overdose problem. Uh, the number of people who died from accidental poisoning is a significant number, and you have all the opioid deaths and all that. It's primarily taking place in young men, and when that happens, you have a bunch of 20-year-olds die. You want to mess with an average, put a bunch of 20s in there averaging with 80s, and those numbers get real real bad real fast. So uh, I saw, and it's particularly bad, one in 25 American 5-year-olds will not make it to their 40th birthday. And they blame things like overdoses, gun violence, dangerous driving, um, lifestyle choices, all those kind of things. So, you know, we all took a hit during COVID. The U.S. needs to probably say we got to do something about especially some of these young deaths by external causes to fix this because it is dragging down the numbers. You know, you mentioned COVID. We took a hit. I mean, we took one of the biggest hits. You know, how does that happen? How does a country like ours, we had the, some of the highest numbers, and that just tells me, I mean, COVID wasn't any worse here than it was anywhere else as far as the, the strain of a virus. I mean, I could be wrong. I'm not a doctor. But I think it just has to do with our health in general. Um, and it just – you saw other countries. Some of them didn't even feel it for the, for the most part. So I don't know what it is, but uh, it's kind of scary to be honest. And when you do travel and go to other places, I, I'll throw something out there real quick. I was in Tokyo in 2017 and every single person in that city was wearing a mask. This was obviously pre-COVID and I had no idea why. Well, now I do. I mean, it's just people live a different lifestyle in other parts of the world. Um, and here it's just, it just seems like it's, it's getting worse. Well, they also had a different situation because I mean, when COVID hit, that was their third or fourth respiratory 
pandemic, or not pandemic, but epidemic that ended up being a pandemic in 20 years. They had the SARS outbreak. They had the avian flu. They had, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what the Middle Eastern one was called, but those were all hit in Asian countries particularly bad. And most of them do origin from China or the Far East. So uh, they are ready and they definitely prepared. But um, let's move on to the last question on something or nothing. There is an effort to have single-day settlement take place in the United States and Canada by May of 2024. India somehow be putting to it and already has it, uh, and the European banks are exploring it's possible. Uh, is the single-day settlement move something, or is this nothing? Uh, I think nothing. I don't understand what the big, big push behind this is or what – I don't know. Maybe you can enlighten me a little bit more. I don't think this is really anything. I, uh, I'm going to go with it's nothing as well. But uh, <laughs> to answer your question, of why is it worth wondering about? Why is this news? Is uh, you know, it's I would complain <laughs> compare it to the plumbing on your house. If you get the sewer pipe fixed or get some other things improved, you kind of expected it to work before. Now it works a little bit better or faster. You know, it's the plumbing of the global capital markets, and so that's good. The only story that maybe got close to having this matter is Robinhood, which, you know, not known for integrity, uh, blamed some of the uproar and the chaos they were challenged with a number of years ago during all those trading issues that the two-day period made it to where their systems couldn't keep up with the volume and the pace of trading, and it left the customers' money at risk when things fell apart. So. Maybe there's something to that, but I, I don't know. I think when we move from T3 to T2 to now T1, I, I don't know. Maybe it's better to have your money settle a little faster, but you know, unless you're trying to get it out of Silicon Valley Bank one day quicker because you found something out, and you're like, oh, well, it hasn't settled yet. I, I don't know that this really helps that much, but it's better to know we have good pipes in the global capital markets here coming soon. Yeah, I mean, that's why we got margin and things of that nature. Robinhood, I mean, listen, when you can go on Robinhood and, and, and apply for level three option trading by filling out a five-question questionnaire and, and get it. Uh, Do you have level three entirely, authorization, Tom? Are you qualified uh, to trade options at that level? I don't. I don't <laughs> trust myself at that level. <laughs> that's like giving me a blank checkbook in the casinos. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. Well, um it's been a fun mid-month episode. We'll be back next month with some tips for the upcoming graduations. We'll talk about how to get a job, how to act, how to dress, and we'll talk about central banks and everything happening. But uh, next episode, we'll have a, a review of April come out the first week of May, and then you get the mid-month and sometime in May. Sounds good. Thanks, Kevin. All right. See you later, Tom. You've been listening to Your Money Momentum, brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to gwadvisors.net. Thanks, and we'll see you next time on Your Money Momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.